Okay, so I don't know. I don't think that the Makorot, I sent the Makorot in yesterday, and I think I might have just missed the deadline in terms of the, uh, was that sent out? So um, I, I think that the Makorot got to you. Did they get to you in the mail -in? <laughs> So then I, I, it's, it's, it's my fault for missing uh, Ayelet's deadline and not, certainly not the, her, her fault, I, so I apologize. Um, so I'm going to put it up and if anyone would like to have a copy for themselves, so just, uh, you know, send me a note in the chat or in the, uh, to my email or uh, WhatsApp and I'll be happy to, to send you the copy. Um, though I... I'll, I'll share a screen. Actually, maybe I can put it up. If I figure out how to put it in the uh, chat, I'll do that myself. Um, but anyway, the um, so I wanted to talk about an issue that comes up. Everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, one of you know, the one one of the wonderful things about Parshat Chukat is that it is um, so chock full of different. Incidents. You know, it's the um, this has nothing to do with the shear per se, but just sort of a this is a uh, an overview. Um, so Sefer Bamidbar roughly divides into two parts, and right? so the the first part, which was ended with uh, Parsha Korach, uh, uh, so that was um, dealt with the first year. Uh, I don't know. There might be someone who's muted mute themselves. Mute yeah, please. Everyone can just mute themselves mute. if you're not on mute. So the... Um, can you uh, mute everybody? Can I mute everybody? Hold on. So I'm just... I just do. Um, okay, I think everyone's muted. Anyway, so the um, Parshat Korach ends the discussion in Sefer Bamidbar of the first year, the, uh, in the, uh, the first two years, I should say, in, uh, of uh, after Yitziat Mitzrayim. Um, and our parsha, first with the, the death of Miriam and then the whole story of Me Meriva, begins the discussion until the end of Sefer Bamidbar of the last year in the desert. Of the all of the incidents that that occur in Parshat Chukat take place in effect 38 years after the last incident that we read about last week in Parshat Korah. They're separated, and we've spoken about this before. They're separated by the Paraduma um, and all the halachot of the Paraduma, and it's clear that the it's not the right place for the Paraduma because. If you recall, back in Parshat Balotcha, so we learned about how the, the people had to become, they came for Korban Pesach, and they weren't able to bring the Korban Pesach because they were Tmeim Lameit, they were they were Lenefesh Adam, they were Tmeim, uh, they had come into contact with um, with dead people, whoever they were, and now is not the time to get into that question, and they became Tahor by the following month when they were able to bring the Pesach Sheni. And that was in the second year. So you know that the Paraduma happened. So the, that was the way that they became Tahor, presumably. Um, and Paraduma should have been brought in Sefer Vayikra with everything else that deals with Tumar Batara. Why should it be brought here in, Parsha, in Sefer Bamidbar and specifically in Parshat Chukat, the beginning of Parshat Chukat? So um, Raviol Benun um, had a uh, wonderful insight in the Anil Dati, and he says that basically Parshat, the what happened in the interceding thirty-eight years between the last incident of Korach and the incident now in terms of May Meriva, what happened? And the answer is that nothing of significance happened. The Torah leaves that blank because nothing of significance happened. The only thing that happened was people marking time in effect. People dying, becoming Tahar, dying, becoming Tahar. That's the only thing that happened in those 38 years. And to, um, and to highlight that, the Torah puts the halachot of para aduma specifically here, because that's what occurred during those 38 years. You can look at it sort of as somewhat depressing. Um, or you can also look at it as meaning a, a bit of a 
uh, that even when people, and maybe this is what happened to a certain extent, if you want to give it a, a larger significance, you know, um, from the time of the end of the Bar Kokhba rebellion until the, the founding of the state, in other words, that we hope for. So what is Jewish history? So to a certain extent, it's moving forward. To a certain extent, you're stuck. They wanted to come. They wanted to live in Eretz Israel. They don't have that opportunity. Um, but that doesn't mean that nothing happens. It means that you continue to prepare the next generation, and that could be symbolized by, by, by Raduma. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. We could talk more about it. And we've spoken about it last year, for example, when we spoke about the halachot of Tuma v'tahara, about Kohanim going into hospitals and the like. That's for another discussion. But why do I like all of this was because I said I love Parshat Chukat. Parshat Chukat crams so many incidents into it. Now, I do all of these incidents that occur in Parshat Chukat and then in continuing into Balak and Pinchas, all of these different incidents that occur within the within just a few months, they all are um, are are put together one after the other, and there are so many of them that we discuss different ones, and uh, other ones don't get the uh, their fair share. And one of the incidents, which I don't think normally gets a lot of, uh, if you will press time, and that's what I wanted to speak about today, is the incident of the Nachash and Nechoshen. The incident where, here, let's just read the Psukim in uh, Parak Chaf Aleph of Sefer Bamidbar, Vaydaber ha'am be'elokim uv Moshe la'mehel itanu b'mitzrayim la'mut b'amidbar ki ein lechem ve'ein mayim v'nafshenu katsa be'lechem ha'klokel. So here it is, it's a difficult sentence to understand, after all, this is, they are presumably on the cusp of going into Eretz Yisrael, and nothing seems to have changed, right? They are now complaining, they want, why did we come out of Egypt after all of this period of time where people have just been living and dying, living and dying, and um, it's 40 years later, and we still don't have any real bread, we don't have any real water, we... Um, we're, we're tired of the man, and there isn't any discussion here, and there isn't even a, a, a situation where Moshe falls on his face or anything along those lines, but rather it's, Hashem ba'am et asrafim, ta'am vayamot amrav mi Yisrael. So God sends um, a, a host of poisonous snakes, People are snake bitten and many people die. So the people come to Moshe and they say, We've sinned, we've spoken negatively about you, about God. Please, please pray to God. So Please pray to Hashem so that he removes these snakes. Moshe prays. So make a, an image of a snake, place it on top of a, of a pole. So whoever was bitten will look at it and live. So God didn't tell him what to make the nachash out of. But Moshe makes it out of copper. Um, whether there is something to the copper itself, is it just a play on the words because of nachash and nechoshet, not clear. But you have the vayisimeu alane. So he makes this, uh, this snake and he puts it onto the, um, onto the pole. V'hayayim nashach nachash et ish so anyone who was bitten by the snake, so the antidote was looking at this snake on the on the pole and um, and living. Very strange incident, um, not really totally explained. One thing that I want to point out is you already see, and perhaps this is an important point to raise with regard to all of the incidents 
that occur. And I'm not going, I already went off onto one tangent. I'm not going to go off on a second tangent yet. I, I'm not promising for the rest of this year, but right now I'm not going to go off the second tangent. But I just want to point out that the parallels of that occur in the first year, as opposed to the incidents that occur in the last year, are very, very important because you see the difference between the way that people react and respond, even if they start with similar issues, the way that they respond is very, very different. And here's a good example of it. The people complained. Now, in the first year when the people complained, so there was a top-down response. God speaks to Moshe. Uh, he tells them, oh, the people are complaining. This isn't good. Moshe might pray. Or Moshe goes and he gets the man, whatever it is in each particular incident. Here, God just responds immediately. He just sends the snakes. He doesn't talk about it. People start dying. There is a response. But who picks up on it? The people themselves. The people have a certain sensitivity that even though they've stumbled, even though they've made a mistake, they take responsibility. Yomru chatanu, we have sinned, and now you go and pray for us. We need your help, but we recognize that it's our problem, and we have to deal with our problem. And then there's the response of the nechash and So the, and if you that basic pattern of a parallel incident, and instead of it being Moshe or God who is the primary focus in terms of the solution, it's the people themselves. That is a very important distinction between the first generation and the second generation, and might point out why it's specifically the second generation that's ready to go into Eretz Yisrael when the first generation was not ready to go into Eretz Yisrael. Um, and so, you know, I'll just tell you to look throughout Parshat Chukat and throughout Pinchas, you'll see time and time again, that's a different shear. I'm not going into it now, but here's just an example um, of it. So the question then becomes, what's this nachash and What is the, uh, what, 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 what help is it? Now, the, there is a common misconception um, uh, that if I just go down the sheet here to take a look that, you know, the, um, I just uh, took uh, some, uh, some images, the, um, that the, the the famous image of a of a staff and uh, with with serpents. So here the two are from the U.S. Medical Corps. This is from Chela um, Rifua, right? So you see that there are sometimes it's with two snakes and sometimes it's with one snake. So for the the there are those who want to claim that okay, it's coming from the Nachash and Nachosha. Here we have a. Um, a snake uh, on a staff, and it is a symbol of healing, just as it's a symbol of healing in, uh, in our Parsha. The answer seems to be that that's not the case. There is a, um, well, first of all, the, the symbol for healing in Greek um, and Roman um, tradition is the second uh, image here, the one that, uh, that Sal took, and also here you can see it in the and the coat of arms of the uh, U.S. Army Medical Department. So the um, th this is a. Uh, by the way, I got this from. Um, it's uh, this is also found on Wikipedia, but I got this from a wonderful source for people who are looking. Um, uh, Talmudology, um, Dr. Jeremy Brown, who goes through different issues in science uh, related to uh, different dapim in the Gemara. So anyway, the um, uh, so I, I recommend uh, taking a look at the site. The um, the be that as it may, in the, here the 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 single snake. This is what's known as the uh, Escalopios, which is a symbol of healing in Greek um, uh, tradition. Um, the um, this double snake is the Caduceus, which is nothing to do with. Rifua, at least not in the Greek tradition, it's actually a um, a symbol of um, of commerce. But the uh, the the double wing also, you see the uh, that that's there. That is a a symbol of commerce. 
Um, and the, uh, but it was somewhere around the 17th, 18th century, um, a, a, a doctor used it as his watermark and, and that's what it seems to have gotten uh, mixed up in that regard. But be that as it may, there is a Greek tradition also of a staff and a snake. Now you could say, and then maybe I did not have a chance to look into this more deeply that perhaps our Jewish tradition somehow influenced the Greek tradition as well. That, that is also a possibility. I saw that being mentioned as a possibility, at least in the Wikipedia article. But usually in terms of the, the notion for the, the idea for uh, the refua, so even though there is some similarity to it, that's not our, um, our symbol of refua. And indeed, the, um, the way that Chazal understood it, because here you have the question, how does the snake on the staff, the nachash and the exactly how does that heal people? And the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah says the following, Ki bedavar ata omer. In a similar manner, and I'll get to the, 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 the source that it's referring to in just one moment, what is it like? But if just like this, whatever this is, Asei lecha saraf besimo toalnes where the Torah tells Moshe, make the snake, put it on a staff. So the Mishnah says, Does a snake uh, uh, give death, meaning the snake on the, st the staff, not the snake, obviously, that, that bit the person. Does a snake give life? What is the issue? It's not the symbol of, if you will, medicine. It's a symbol of faith. When you look at the snake, so then you are looking up. And when you look up, you are mishabed at libam lavien shabashamayim. As I said, it's, they, they came and they said, chatanu. So here there is a more concrete tool to allow us to be focusing on God. And the, the focus on God is when I look up at the snake, so then I think of God, and when I think of God, that's when I'm healed. And if not, if I don't have that kind of kavana, so then hayuni mokim, they would, um, they would literally uh, rot away. So the, um, this is the idea that, the, uh, that the, 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 the Mishnah is trying to say. What is the ki yotzei badavar? What is the similarity, the similar case? So the similar case, and this is again a parallel to the first generation, is when Moshe raises his hands in the battle of Amalek um, in the end of uh, Parshat Bishalach. And so when Moshe raises his hands, and so the Mishnah asks, Moshe Do the hands of Moshe make war? I mean, what does that mean? The hands go up and they win. And the hands come down and they lose. Right? But how, how does that exactly work on a, on a supernatural level even? And the, the Mishnah's answer is that no. It's that when they looked at the hands, so then they were thinking of Aviyem Sheba Shamayim. And they and that's what allowed them to to win, but when they were um, but when Moshe's hand slipped, so they were no longer thinking of God, and then um, the uh, the Amalekim had the upper hand. So you have again a similar type of story between the first generation and the second generation. Be that as it may, let's take a look at another example of rifua when it comes to snakes, because what I want to focus on is how are we supposed to take a look, this is really the focus of the shear, is to what, how do we view our medicine? Oh, it's the, um, if, if, and if, whether or not it's our symbol or whether it is a Greek symbol, you have this idea, okay, you have a, uh, what do we believe in natural medicine using um, uh, there are uh, there are physicians in the audience today 
And we have the uh, science of medicine and the and, and medical science, that's what heals people. Um, or do we just simply say that Ani Hashem Rofecha, Kol Machala Asher Samti B'Bitzrayim Lo Asib Alecha, Ki Ani Hashem Rofecha, all of the ailments that befell the Egyptians will not befall you, God tells us, because I am God, your healer. So we say to Elim when Rahman al someone is ill, we go to the doctors as well, and we and we and we follow the medical science of our of our day. How does that exactly work uh, together in one level or another? Is there an ideal? Is there not an ideal? So here, our uh, uh, our our Mishnah and our Psukim uh, seem to be indicating that it's totally in God's hands. Right? There isn't something which is no one is able has been able to show the um, any causal connection between looking at brass snakes or copper snakes and being healed from snake bites, and so it's clearly coming from uh, from God. If it's coming from God, so then it is a uh, so that's a miraculous healing, and perhaps that's what we should be doing in general. Um, another case in the Mishnah. Uh, in the Gemara, it's a bright, it's not a Mishnah, excuse me. Tanu Rabbanan, Gemara and Brachot. Ma'aseh b'makom echad shahaya arvad. There was a place which was being um, plagued, I guess you could say, by a serpent. V'haya mazik et abriot. And this serpent, perhaps it was more than one, the serpent was... Um, was harming uh, people of the area. They came and they told Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa about the, this, uh, this, this terrible thing that was going on. Amar lahem, heru li et choro. So Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa said, I'll take care of it. Show me where the, uh, the snake's um, den is. Heru at Choro, they showed him the opening to the snakes, uh, to, the, to, to his tunnel. Natan Akevo al Piachor. So Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa placed his heel at the opening of the, um, of the snake's lair. Yatsa Unishacho. So the snake came out, saw the heel, bit the heel. Umait Oto Arvad. And the, the serpent died as a result. Nitalo al Ktefo. So Rabbi Hanina Bedosa pulls this dead snake out. And we'll say it's a couple of meters long. And Heveu Lebet Midrash. And he brings this giant snake, this serpent, to the Bet Midrash. Amar Lehem. Ra'ubanai. Take a look. Ein Arvad Memit Elahachet Memit. So it. Understand, it's not the venom that kills, it's sin that kills. Woe is to the man who gets snake bitten, and woe is the snake who, bit, who bites Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Okay? But that line, Ein arvad meimit, ela achet meimit. Right? It's not the poison, it's the it's it's your sin. That makes you vulnerable. So Khanina Mendoza was saying, I have the uh, I was invulnerable because I did not was not impacted by the snake, was not impacted by the sin. Now, maybe this is referring to some level to some kind of if I talk about snakes to uh, some kind of chet kadmon, something, some, uh, some sin that goes all the way back to Gan Eden, and Rabbi Hanina ben is saying, I can stop that sin. Not totally clear. But be that as it may, whatever Rabbi Hanina ben is saying is that, well, the venom doesn't kill. It is chet. Um, now, on the other hand, we have uh, a, a pasuk, which we... Uh, uh, which is 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 Chazal have a drasha for. Im yakum vehitalech bechutz al mishanto v'nikah hamakeh 
Rak shifto yiten virapo yirape. So here, the Torah uh, makes the following assumption, uh, assertion. You, we, it, um, we're talking about a, uh, an incident. This is in uh, Parshat Mishpatim. In the psukim that deal with uh, damages, deal with when people wound one another, what are the compensation that's necessary, what happens if a person, God forbid, is killed by another person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here, the Torah tells us, if the victim gets up and is able to walk on his, with using his staff, then nikah the person who is the, uh, the attacker, is able, will not be executed. In the previous psukim, it talks about how the, um, if a person um, murders another individual, so he, he is to uh, be executed as well. However, the, if a, you only wound the other person, it's not a, a fatal wound. So then nikah the person is going to be exonerated from the death sentence. Rak shifto yiten, however, he has to pay for the, the damages here with regard specifically to, um, to uh, compensation for loss of uh, employment. And rapo yirape, and he um, has to be, and he will be healed. Now, the idea of healing here is, under, is used for several things, which I'm not going to get into, but one of the things is this is where we learn that, a, um, that one, of the, uh, one of the compensations that a, uh, an attacker has to pay his, uh, his victim for is, um, is also his medical expenses for the, uh, for the healing. Um, so the um, so this is the um, uh, so that's on one level. However, the Gemara also teaches us something else from here. Number five, Tanya de Bey Rabbi Shmuel Omer v'Rapo Yirape Mikan Shenitan Reshut L'Rofei L'Rafo. So here, the Torah by saying v'Rapo Yirape. The Torah is not merely saying, okay, when the person is healed, he'll be healed. It's not even saying only that the cost of the medical expenses fall on the perpetrator, but it's saying, nitan rishut l'rofei l'rapo. Let's say that there is permission for the healer to heal. Or does it say, it's something which we allow him, that we could have said that, uh, we don't believe in medicine, that we'll be, um, uh, that we will follow the quietest attitude, that you accept whatever God, whatever happens to you from God. And if God wants to heal you, he'll heal you. And if he doesn't want to heal you, he won't heal you. Um, but we cannot uh, intervene in the divine plan. That is a... Uh, an acceptable, if you will, from a theological perspective, that's an acceptable uh, response. Here, Chazal say this, this pasuk is telling us that that's not the Jewish response. That the, that in the Jewish response, the Torah has given us license to, um, to heal and has given license to the physician to, uh, to attempt to, uh, to, heal the, uh, to heal the victim. Um, the Torah, so the, the, the Tosfot, the Rishonim, discuss this at greater length. I'm just picking um, two, one from a Rishon and one from a, uh, uh, an Achron. The, um, the Tosfot on the page says the following. And if you were to ask, I I can learn that concept. I don't have to say rapo ye rape. I could just simply say rak shifto yiten virafe, and he will be healed. If you will be, if you say you will be healed, so then presumably there is a healer too. And I can learn this concept without the double lashon. Why does the Torah have to say rapo ye rape? And so, oh, I apologize for not opening up all of the. Uh, 
um, abbreviations. B'yesh Lomar, so Tosfos says, Dahava Amina, I would have thought, had the Torah only said the word verapo, not rapo yerape, I would have thought, Hane Mile, Make Bide Adam, Avalcholi Haba Bide Shamayim, Kishimirape, Nirekisota Xerata Melech, Kemash Balan Dishari. So here Tosfos has a uh, an interesting argument. He says, listen, I can differentiate between different situations. Why do we have this, this in, in context, what is going on here? The person has, the, the person is a victim of an attack. And so there has already been intervention, if you will, in the divine process. You have a, a victim, perhaps an innocent victim, and you have a criminal who's attacked him. So now the, um, the, the victim um, wants to be healed. So you say, well, no, God, it's in God's hand. But it wasn't in God's hand when, when, when she hit me, when she shot me, it was in her hand at that point. So if it was in her hand then, why should it be in God's hands only to heal me? So if I just say virapo, I would say, okay, it's not only in God's hands. A, a victim of a crime can go to a physician. But what happens if you're dealing with something where there is no, um, there's, no uh, there's no criminal? A person um, has a strep throat. So uh, why should you be able to go and get antibiotics? The God sent those bacteria to... In, uh, to invade your body. So let God take care of it. So that Tosfut says, verapo ye rape. The extra ye rape is there to tell you that even when it seems that the ailment is, from, is, is divine, nevertheless, people have the right to the license to try to, to heal the, uh, the illness. Uh, that's, uh, so we don't, uh, now, I, you know, I brought up the, you know, bacteria. Tosot, of course, had no idea what was causing um, throat infections. But the idea, and it could very well have seemed much more as being just coming out of nowhere when someone came down with what we would now say is a strep throat. But, the, uh, but nevertheless, Tosot is saying that if you, uh, the, 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 that we have the license to try to heal that. Okay, so that's uh, Tosfot's uh, answer. Um, many years later, now this is uh, you know, jumping from the, the 12th century to the beginning of the 20th century. Rav Kook, in one of his chuvot, um, deals with this as well. The, um, so he gives a slightly different answer. His answer as to why the Torah has to give this license is the following. Ikara refua mitzad chokmata misupeketi. So when it comes to um, medicine and all science, I guess, to a certain extent, so there is a theoretical that's involved. When you go to, um, to, the, to the doctor, and uh, if, if, the, if she's a good doctor, she'll tell you that the treatment is not necessarily a 100% cure. There are almost, uh, I'll ask any of the physicians here, are there such a thing as a 100% cure? Was, uh, even if you have something which is almost always taken care of by, uh, you know, by whatever medication, there might be uh, one in a thousand cases that for whatever the reason, the uh, antibiotics, and antibiotics isn't even a good example because of how many generations of antibiotics are there already. But in terms of that, the the, the particular uh, uh, a a particular treatment has uh, going through with all the vaccines and the like, even if it's a ninety five percent efficacy rate, so that's five percent where it's not helping. So you, all rifua is misupeka, has a certain element of doubt. Shim hayadavar barur. Um, if it was totally clear that the medicine would work, how, if I know with 100% assurity that the treatment will work, 
How could I ever even begin to think that I need a pasuk to tell me? If a person trips and he slips and uh, as a result, he's, um, uh, he, he, he falls into a, uh, into a lake and he can't swim. So I have a chiyuv to jump in and save that person. That's lo tamod al dam reyecha. I have to move the person if there's a, uh, a car that's coming her way. So that is 100%. If, I, if, there's a, if a person's about to get hit by a car and I pull her out of the road, so that is 100%. And of course I have that chiyuv of pikuach nefesh. But if I'm giving a, um, some kind of treatment for an illness and it doesn't have a 100% um, efficacy rate. So then maybe the Torah is saying, well, the moment that it's a, a question, so then it's just a question of what the odds are. So there are people who survive strep throat. There are people who st- survive even terminal, what would might be terminal illnesses when we look at them. People can survive them. We'll say it was a miracle that they survived it, but you don't have to say necessarily it's a miracle. You just simply say, well, there is a one in a thousand, one in a 10,000 of someone who is going to be able to survive um, this particular cancer. And yet, the, so now the treatment moves the needle and the treatment turns it from again, one in 10,000 to um, whatever, we'll say eight out of 10 who, are, who are, will be survivors. So then you, what gives you the right to move the needle? Let God decide what the odds are going to be. So that is where the pasuk comes and says that rapo yirape. Because even though you can say, well, even with the best of medical care, there are going to be people who nevertheless succumb to their, uh, to their ailments. And even without any care, some people will survive. So therefore, I don't have the right to get involved. And that's where the Torah says, as a result, I don't have to say, well, maybe that God is going to not be happy with my uh, efforts. The, um, and therefore, the Torah has to give the Rishut um, because Mikol makom ein derech acheret lifnei b'nei adam. This is the idea that the Torah is telling us that regardless, we have the right to intervene. So both of these sources, and as I said, they're separated by about 700, 800 years, but both of these sources, and there are many others, and we'll see some of that in a moment, the, that basically say the Torah is telling people that they have the right and the expectation. Because you could say that once I have the expectation, the, the reshut, as it were, it is a mitzvah. This is what I have to go ahead and do. I have to get involved, and I don't have a right to let things go there, uh, take their, their natural course, if you will, or not call it the natural course, call it the supernatural course, and let God decide whether the person will be healed or not. There is a, we'll say, a counter uh, camp. Counter camp, we'll take a look at several examples. Of this. One is the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra on that pasuk, and Rabbeinu Bachai um, expands upon the idea a little bit. The Ibn Ezra on that very same pasuk, Perak Hafal of Pasuk Yutet. So he says the following Rapo Yirape, Loot, Shinatan Meshut Lerofim, Lerape, Amakot, Map Saim, and he says, um, the Shiye Ra'u Bechutz. Okay, what are we talking about here? Which kind of uh, um, which kind of uh, 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 treatments are we going to have when they are visible from the outside? Or as you have a, a almost exactly what Tosva told us earlier is not the case. Ezra's arguing with the Tosva. Tosva says, Rapo Yirape is expansive. It includes not only external wounds that were uh, inflicted on people, but also internal ailments. 
And that's why I have the Lashon of Rapo Yerapet. That's what Tosfot says. Ibn Ezra says, no, I have to look at the context of the Pasuk. Where does the Pasuk tell me Rapo Yerapet? It's speaking specifically about a situation where one person injured another person. Under those circumstances, so he is expanding it somewhat because he's saying that it's any external wound. So presumably it would also include a um, something which it was an accident where a person uh, slipped and fall and fell, excuse me, and um, and broke their leg. Okay, so that also might be included. However, rak kol choli shehu bifnim beguf biyad Hashem lerapoto v'chein katuv. So the the um, so the Ibn Ezra says that I'm going to make a distinction between, or the Torah is making a distinction between external uh, injury and uh, internal ailments. If it's an internal ailment, if it's an illness of some kind, that's God's business. If there is a um, a person who is uh, who's ill, um, so then that person was came down with the illness, and God decided to strike him down or strike her down, and now it's up to God to to heal that person. Um, the um, uh, so this is something which the uh, which is surprising, right? Was that basically saying that the Torah is not necessarily giving. A, uh, a li full license to heal, but only in case of external injuries. Now, I don't know what would be the Ibn Ezra's response if I were to ask him, well, that works okay with your understanding of, of, uh, of maladies and illnesses. In other words, your understanding in the, in the medieval period that where you don't understand why people are are falling ill, and there you don't have um, a, a, a you know the, even the term something like uh, um, malaria. So malaria comes from the um, the Italian and the and the Latin of being bad air, right? That you that that you just believe that the illness is 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 befalling people because of something in the air, right? So, and there's no way for us to even begin to understand what it is. So then that's, um, then that's something that came from God. But the moment that I know that it's not um, a, a malaria is not being caused by some vapor uh, that is divine perhaps, uh, or it's supernatural in that particular area, but is being um, passed on by, uh, by by mosquitoes, by parasites that, that, that are being spread from the mosquito to the host. So so now that's no different than a an ailment which is caused because a person fell off a cliff. But they're both external, as it were. There is a pathogen, and so then the pathogen is as much of a um, an enemy. As is the uh, as 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 a as a human being hitting someone with a club, so the so perhaps even the Ibn Ezra would or might argue that the moment that I know what the causes of diseases are, so then it's a an external threat, right? So I don't I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I don't know what the Ibn Ezra would respond because I'm not uh, he's not here for me to ask the question. But I I think that it's a uh, a reasonable um, a reasonable question to be asked, even according to this approach. Um, the um, uh, the as I said, the uh, Rabbeinu Bachai goes a little bit further. You know, I, I'm gonna we'll leave the Rabbeinu Bachai alone because there are a lot of makarot and I want to cover as many makarot. Only have about half an hour left. So that is the. Uh, but basically, the Rabbeinu Bachai is taking this approach of the Ibn Ezra um, as well. The um, the Mishnah in uh, Psachim, it's really a Tosefta, which was added onto our Mishnah. It's found in the, in the text. It's the Rambam, uh, even though it's a Tosefta, may, and he knows that it's a Tosefta, but nevertheless, 
he says explicitly it's a Tosefta, but nevertheless, he felt it was an important enough Ma'amar uh, Chazal to for him to comment in his comment on the in his commentary to the Mishnah. The the Mishnah reads the following, or the Tosefta. Shishad Varim Asa Chizkiyahu Hamelech. So Chizkiyahu um, did six different things. To um, that were um, that were worthy of comment. Al shlosha hodulo, v'al shlosha lo hodulo. Three of them were accepted and praised by the chachamim, and three um, actions of Chizkiyahu Melech were uh, the chachamim uh, did not praise. Okay, so I'm just going to. I'm not going to read all of them now. I just want to just give you an example of what. The um, the what the chachamim did not necessarily think was praiseworthy. Perhaps the most famous thing that Chizkiyahu did, and probably uh, many of us, if not all of us, have visited it, is the the tunnel Chizkiyahu's tunnel in Ir David, where Chizkiyahu channeled ordered what he the what there was a. Uh, when Ashur was setting siege to Yerushalayim and the water supply um, was on the uh, was on the was outside of the walls, the Gichon, and so in order to protect the water supply for Yerushalayim, so he had that tunnel uh, chiseled out, right, and uh, that uh, diverted the water supply into the walls, and that's one of the things that, for whatever the reason, lo hodulo. Um, the Satam Me Gichon Ha'elyon Velo Hodulo. And so this is just an example of um, the, uh, it's, a, it's a much longer discussion, which I don't, we don't have time for right now, but just something to think about. In other words, what is considered to be praiseworthy within that context? So the, here is one of the things, two things that we'll mention that Hodulo. I'm going to skip the first one. Kitet nachash hanechoshet v'hodulo, ganaz sefer refuot v'hodulo. So here are two of the three. We'll leave the third aside at the moment. What did uh, the Chachamim praise him for? They praised him for destroying the nachash hanechoshet and for having a safer refuot, not clear what a safer refuot is, we'll see that that's the issue right now, there was a some kind of book of healing. And the Chachamim thanked him for that. And why isn't the highlight coming up? The, um, uh, I don't know what, what's going here. The, um, the, but the point though is, is that the first he destroyed the Nachash and the you can understand that the idea of the um, of the destroying the nechash and the um, was basically because the nechash and the had become a form of avodazara. People were had, it had had healing power in the time of the midbar. Here we are, several hundred years later. People are looking at it um, uh, superstitiously. So Chizkiyahu um, destroyed the nechash and the the uh, Sefer Rifuot, so this book of healing, and he, he ganas, he hides it, he puts it aside so that people don't read it, and that is considered to be praiseworthy. Rashi on the spot says the following, ganas Sefer Rifuot, kidichtiv, v'hatov be'inecha asiti, v'amrinan bebrachot she'ganas Sefer Rifuot. What was the problem? People wouldn't, people stopped praying. They had the refuah. There are those who say this is the safer refuah of Shlomo Hamela. So when people had the cure, so people stopped praying. Their hearts literally were not humbled. And so Chizkiyahu felt that that was a religious failing. So it's more. So it was important for people to have this um, uh, religious sensitivity. So he put away the refua and the um, uh, and people didn't. Uh, uh, people were not healed. 
That's the way that the uh, that um, the, that Rashi understands it. The um, the, Ram, the Rambam in his Sefer, uh, his parish to the Mishnayot, as I said, it's not really a Mishnah, it's a Tosefta. And I think that the Rambam went out of his way to put it into his perush because he went ballistic. He could not possibly accept this reading of the Gemara at all. And uh, we'll read the Rambam, in, uh, maybe not quite in full, but almost. Zot halacha hi Tosefet hi Tosefta. So I have to I have to explain this. There is a clear benefit by explaining it. Sefer Rifuot Aya Sefer. What was the Sefer Rifuot? Shaya in Yanoli Rifuot Bidvarim Shalohi Tira Torah. So he said, "What is the Sefer Rifuot? Sefer Rifuot has to be something where the um, the means of the Therapy where the things that the Torah did not allow. So, for example, what were they? Um, basically, we'll say he goes on and he says um, using various um, talismans and the like to uh, to heal, using um, uh, uh, medicines and and treatments which have no scientific basis whatsoever. So those were things, but sometimes they work. Why do they sometimes they work? It could be that they work because the Rambam wouldn't have used this terminology, but maybe it worked because of placebo effect. Maybe they work because if you want, if you want to be a uh, more superstitious person and believe, which the Rambam himself was not, would felt that sometimes those things that we feel are um, that are that are uh, that are hocus pocus. Maybe there is something to the supernatural. And that's what the Torah is telling us to stay away from when the Torah tells us not to go to um, the uh, to the to the mechashef, not to go to the magicians and the like, because there perhaps there is something to it on a supernatural level, but it's a level of, of superstition that we are told to stay away from. Whatever the reason, that's the safer refuel. But then he says the there are those. And he goes on, he has several lines of this uh, uh, discussion, and he says the following. So the reason, there are those who say along the lines of what Rashi said. There are those who say that the that there was this uh, this book of healing and with real cures to them. And people would go to the book. And when Chizkiyahu saw that people were not turning to God, he said, they're going to hospitals, they're going to doctors, they're going taking care of medicine. That's a terrible thing because they, they've left God behind. So he immediately put the book away. So the, um, the Rambam, as I said, is, is going to have nothing of this. The Rambam says, Atash ma hefsed Now listen to how terrible and destructive this idea is. This is one of the worst possible things that a person could ever do. And how can you go and say Chizkiyahu did it? And moreover, the Chachamim agreed with him for doing it. Right? This is terrible because if you take this, the Rambam says, reducto ad absurdum. Let's take this all the way. So according to these, the proponents, he's talking about Rashi. I'm going to see in a moment, he's talking about the Ramban as well. So according to the, the, these proponents, right? You're hungry. So you go to the refrigerator and you take food and you don't say, well, if God wanted me to survive, I could survive without food. 
So my eating is clearly a indication that I don't have faith in God, right? Similarly, anybody who says that the, so he says, Demar lahem, hoi hashotim, oh, you foolish people, kasher no dalashem be'eta achila, shehimtzi li ma sheyasbiya oti. So I say, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz, I say, hazan et hakol, I thank God, for giving me the natural means to satiate my hunger. By the same token, I should make a bracha when I come up with a medical cure. The same way that I'm saying, I should say, and it being done through the same human agencies. Who were the ones who harvested the grain? Who were the ones who planted the grain in the first place? Who were the ones who made the bread? Who were the ones who ate the bread? It was all people. We took what God gave us and we turned that into food production. And we thank God for the food production. We have antibiotics. We thank God for the antibiotics. We thank God for the vaccines. They thank God for giving us the wherewithal to conquer disease. That's what the Rambam says. So it can't be, it is impossible for the Rambam, from, from the Rambam's perspective to say that that's what Chizkiyahu was doing. What Chizkiyahu was doing, the Rambam says, was dealing with superstitions. People who thought that there were cures for diseases or any other ailments that were not natural and the, if they're not natural, then the only uh, address to turn to is God. Because if there are things that are beyond medical science, so then you turn to God and you ask for a miracle. And hopefully God will answer us and, uh, and heal us. But if you have the, the natural means to deal with it, so you thank God for giving us the natural means to deal with the disease. That is the, uh, the Rambam's approach. As I said, it's very different than the than Rashi. It's very different than the Ibn Ezra. Because if you recall, the Ibn Ezra said, if you're talking about internal ailments, so that's something that is God-given or God sent, and it's not for people to get involved with. The Ramban, perhaps, is the most famous, um, uh, is the most famous commentator in, with, in, in this second school opposed to the Rambam. Remember the Ramban, Rashi and the Ibn Ezra were writing, well, the Ibn Ezra was writing at about the same time as the Rambam, but the, um, the Ramban is, is well after the Rambam. The, however, he says the following, he's talking about the, the Pasuk of Kiani Hashem Rofecha that I referred to before, Hatam B'zeh um, Ki Abrachot, so the, um, this is with regard, he's writing this in the, uh, the Tochacha in uh, the end of Sefer Vayikra. Um, the idea that the, Ram, the Ramban uh, speaks about in many different places where things that occur in the world, what he calls nes nistar, they seem to be the natural order. They're being the, uh, maybe they are the natural order, but it's being directed by God. So the, um, the Ramban says that when a person is spiritually, um, is spiritually whole, so then God will protect him um, from the um, from whatever diseases and the like that uh, that, that that exist. Um, the um, that is the the, the Ramban's uh, basic approach. So now he within that context he discusses. Um, what happens in terms of disease, and he talks about specifically this uh, the, the, this this idea that Chizkiyahu put away the uh, Sefer Rifua, um, and he explains in the following manner. Um, so he so his his explanation is. Um, 
the um, um, uh, let's take a explain aval hadoresh Hashem binavi. If you have the way to turn to the uh, to God through a navi, lo yidrosh berofim. So then you'll never go to a a doctor. Uma, listen to this line. It's an incredible line. Uma chelak larofim bebeit osei ritzon Hashem. What place does a doctor have in the house of those who, who follow in God's ways? After God has promised us that I will bless your bread, I will bless your water, I will remove disease from your midst. Ultimately, what do doctors do? Doctors tell you to eat well, eat right, exercise, do uh, stay, uh, stay, live a healthy lifestyle. So, in effect, you are doctors are playing God because God has blessed the the, the food. God has uh, given us the uh, the directives of what to be doing. That's what I should be doing. The um, so the idea then is, well, what about Rapo Yirape? How does he understand it? So he quotes a Gemara that I didn't bring. And it says the following, So the Rambam, the Rambam by the way, himself um, was a physician. So the... Um, uh, and actually, that's a question as to whether he was a physician or not. But there is certainly a uh, a strong tradition that he was a physician, and he, and there is clearly a tradition that he his students went to doctors. So why do people go to doctors? Why why are we not um, uh, do we not follow um, uh, the uh, uh, Christian scientists? And just simply say that we're not going to go to, uh, to we're not going to uh, undergo any medical procedure whatsoever. We'll be healed by God. So the answer is is the idea that the, this line here in the Gemara ain't darkam shel bnei adam berfuot Really, people don't need medicine, but nevertheless, people have used medicine. So the um, and the answer ahem nahagu berfuot. So the, the Ramban says that this is a fallen state of man. The Torah recognizes that, or God recognizes, that people look for cures. God lets us look for the cure. Natan Rishut Lerofe means that we have permission, but it's not necessarily a good thing to be doing. If this is what we do, so then God says, okay, I'll let the natural process work. But the nasni star, this hidden miracle, can be in two, one of two ways. Hidden miracle is that it's, a, okay, it's a miracle. A hidden miracle is that it looks as though it's the natural order. So God is saying, I'll let you work with the natural order. When he decides to get involved or not get involved, that's, that's God's business. That's not our business. But in terms of the perspective of the of the individual, so we're allowed to um, to seek out medical uh, assistance, but we should recognize that it is a a fallen state, and it's not an ideal state. Now, the Ramban, the Ramban, the Ramban doesn't really talk about at least out here. Well, what about a person who says, "I want to, uh, I, I I understand, I have the permission to take the antibiotic." But I want to trust God. I don't want to um, show any uh, wavering in my faith in God. Can I refuse medical treatment halakhically and say that, well, what, God, what God's will will be? And I'll say a lot of Tehillim. I am Reb Chanina Ben Dosa. Right? What gave Reb Chanina Ben Dosa the right to put his heel on the on the snake hole, what, did he know for sure that he was going to be uh, not impacted by the snake? Apparently, yes. So, if I have that same kind of confidence, so 
um, and that same kind of faith. May I say, okay, God has given me the reshut, but I don't want to take the reshut. I want to put my trust in God. Is that something which is permissible or not? So here the Ramban himself, in his, this was what we just read, was his Perush al Torah. But the Ramban has a, um, has several halachic works. Um, one of the more important halachic works that the Ramban wrote was, uh, was, a, was a sefer called Torah Ta'adam, right? the Torah of man. And it's basically a, um, a, 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 a sefer that deals with life cycle issues. That's why he called it Torah Ta'adam. And specifically, issues that deal with the end of life. And the Ramban in this sefer, um, the, he was the first to really put together Hilchot Avelut in a, um, in a concise and organized fashion. That's in Torah Ta'adam. Um, the Shulchan Aruch, before him the tour, basically follows the Torah Ta'adam in terms of the structure. And his Sefer begins before people die, people go, uh, uh, there's this Shar HaRifua, question of getting healed and hopefully uh, being successful in those efforts. So, the Ramban talks about all sorts of medical issues as well in Sefer Torah Adam, and here he's speaking halachically. Again, in the in the Parasha Torah, he's speaking more um, as a parsha, and he's speaking hashkafically. Here he's speaking halachically, and here he says the following: He says with regard to the halacha b'shut lerafot, Lomar, this comes to teach me she'ein asur mishum chash hashagaga. I'll leave that aside. Inami shelo yomru akadosh baruch hu mochetz v'hu marpe. The why does the Torah give me this reshut? Because I shouldn't say that God was the one who smote the person down, struck him down, and therefore I shouldn't get involved. She'ein darkan shel bnei adam berefuot el shenahagu. Right, but the and since. Ramban is following what he said earlier. Again, it doesn't matter which one he wrote first. The same basic idea, what we read earlier, that this was only reshut to go. And so I could say, well, I shouldn't get involved ideally. So he says explicitly, hi, reshut, reshut the mitzvah, the mitzvah le rafot, ubiklal pikuach nefeshu. So don't get mistaken. This reshut, this permission that we have, it's not a bidi avad that we say, okay, people, maybe the, the original cause was not the ideal. Maybe if we were on the highest possible uh, spiritual level, we wouldn't need medical science, maybe, if that were the case. But now that we don't, we're not on that level, God gives us permission to go and get healed, gets, gives us permission. So now I say, I don't want to do it. So the Ramban says, no, 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 no. Now it's a mitzvah. Under, under these circumstances, it's a mitzvah, and you have to go get healed. You don't have the choice. That's the, what the Torah is saying. This reading of the Ramban is, um, it seems to be a little bit different. If you, we don't have time to really look in the, the Perusha Torah carefully. It doesn't sound that way in the Perusha Torah. Perusha Torah sounds much more that a person is able to lift himself up or herself up in terms of their, their spirituality to basically be constantly in God's orbit and is able to um, uh, be the beneficiary of divine providence. That would seem to allow you to do it. But at least in his halachic work, the Ramban doesn't go that direction and says that we're at this lower level now. And since we're at the lower level, then it's a mitzvah to seek out medical assistance. The Rav, in a footnote in Lonely Man of Faith, here in number 17, so he reads this very clearly. And the, Ramba, the Rav is, um, is very much in this regard Maimonidean, in terms of his understanding that there is a very strong um, uh, impetus for us to be not, it's a mitzvah to, to, to be a doctor. It's a mitzvah to, to heal. It's a mitzvah more than just to be healing. It's a mitzvah to, for man to, uh, to, to uh, it's a majestic gesture, the Rav says, for, the, for man to, um, to, be able to, um, to, to be able to control his environment. He says that that's the basic, one of the basic themes in uh, Lonely Man of Faith. So having said this, 
He says, this is very much clear, is most pronounced in the halacha's relationship to scientific, med- to scientific medicine and the art of healing. So that is where it comes mostly to come. And then when he quotes the Ramban in this context, he says, Nachmanides observation in, um, in Vayikra refers to an ideal state of the covenantal community enjoying unlimited divine grace and has no application therefore to the imperfect state of affairs in the ordinary world. That's the, the way that the, the Rav understood it. And as I said, it could very well be that that's what the Torah to Adam is saying himself um, when he's speaking halachically. If, the, if, you, if you ask me, as I said, when my reading of the Perish Torah itself isn't quite that way. The, um, the, the, the other way, however, and I won't, we don't have time to read all of the sources now, I'll just read the, um, uh, the, the Avnei Nezer, the, 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 the Sachar Shavar, the beginning of the 20th century he's writing, um, uh, this, and he says the following, um, Mikom, number 16, Mikom makom nireh devadai yuchal acholeh hatzadik lismoch ala ibn Ezra Ramban kishinogeya lemaachalot asurot becholim shebifnim, shelo lismoch ala rufim. So he says, if it, we're talking about um, in, internal um, illnesses, so internal medicine, so then you have the right, a person can forego treatment. A person can say, I want to accept the, um, uh, the divine uh, uh, providence. And if my tehillim work, my tehillim will work. And if my tehillim don't work, so that's God's will. And I'm not going to uh, take the, the medication. Um, the... Uh, However, he says, that's only if a person is Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Um, so then that is something that a posek has to be dealing with. If you're dealing with a person who isn't such a tzaddik, he's just a, uh, uh, he or she is a simple Jew. Right, which is not a bad thing to be, but you're not the biggest Sadiq, you're not Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. So, nevertheless, can you do it? He leaves it open as perhaps that you can. He, it's not clear that we'll allow it, and generally, post game will answer it for most people, but we have the, uh, the, the opening um, of saying this the, that uh, there are those post game who, uh, who will say this. Um, the, um, perhaps I'll come back, I'll finish with the, uh, with Rav Cook at number 18, but before I get to Rav Cook very quickly, just something that I saw was I was preparing, this was, I guess, where, why I missed the deadline on the Daf Makorot, I saw this, uh, piece that, uh, Rav Yitzchak Zilberstein, he's, uh, a, um, uh, a, the, one of the leaders of the, uh, uh, the Charedim Litaim today, and he is, the uh, was uh, is the brother-in-law of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, um, and he in, uh, in his sefer um, dealing with medical issues. So this is what he says. Um, the question was: This is a question from about twenty years ago uh, that they received from the emergency room in uh, Sharei Tzedek of uh, women in the neonatal ward. The women uh, who would um, did not want to undergo ultrasounds. Um, for if just to uh, to find out if there were any um, any uh, uh, congenital diseases that could be picked up uh, in the ultrasound and how to deal with them um, b- while the baby was in utero, and the um, and the, the the question that was sent uh, said he raised the two examples of where have knowing the um, what the, the condition of the of the of the baby was while it was still a, a fetus, helped the treatment when the child was born. And uh, it said, had they not known it at the time of the birth, so there's a good chance that the, there would have been very serious medical ramifications um, and consequences from their not knowing it. And uh, will the, uh, can the, the can would there be a psak that all women should have an ultrasound to, uh, as for screening? So, 
this was the answer. The answer was, uh, this is just part of the answer. The, 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 but this part was just kind of, to my mind, was mind blowing. So he said, at the time of Shlita, so women who come to Chacham to be blessed for the uh, successful pregnancy and delivery, they are unaware of it. It's a normal pregnancy. There isn't anything which is, uh, the, the, any indication that anything's wrong. It is better not to be, to have the, to be checked. Even though there is a good chance that the, the, that the screening will be beneficial. If we don't know that there's a problem, so then tefillot work better. Tefillot, and he goes on to explain how tefillot and and divine inter, uh, intervention is better when it's not a clear, um, a clear, uh, a, a, a clear nace that's being uh, that's involved. The moment that I know that there is an ailment, and I pray, and now God has to do something miraculous to to fix this congenital defect. But if I didn't know that the defect existed, and then God heals the heart. Let's say there's a, some kind of uh, uh, d- d- a heart defect. So there wasn't a miracle, or at least not an overt miracle, because no one knew it. If, if a miracle happens and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? And the answer is it doesn't make a sound, but it's still a miracle. So it's better for tefillot to happen when you don't know that there's a problem. So this, this idea, he continues to say that if the woman wants to have the testing, then we certainly should say it's a good thing that, you know, you're going in, you know, and basically it's a, but the idea to say that, well, we know that this, the test will help, but tefillot can help better, right? So that idea is still, is still around, okay? Just that, uh, I shouldn't say still around. It's saying that is a, an approach which there are post who accept. Ad hayom hazeh. The um, I'll just finish as I said with the uh, um, with the with, the, with Rav Kook. Um, Rav Kook in his uh, commentary to Agadot. So when he explains this, the um, he points out, and this is what I would want to want to finish with. It's not a question of whether you should be going. To, only a question of going to doctors, not going to go to doctors, but to be aware. Rav Kook accepts the Rambam's reading and the Ramban's reading. He says, yes, it's true that we have the mitzvah to be getting um, to be getting medical assistance. But nevertheless, what Chizkiyahu did was put aside a medical textbook. And that was praiseworthy because you have to balance the two. We have to, and this is something which we all need to be thinking about. How do you reach the point where you say, okay, I value medical science. And there is this mission that mankind has as a whole, perhaps, to be able to control the destiny, what, what the Rav calls the idea of Adam one, the idea of majestic man. Yes, we have this, this dignity and this majesty, and it's a wonderful thing that we live in an era where uh, we have a life expectancy over 80 years and not of a life expectancy the way it was a little bit over 100 years ago when it was 40, 45. Yes, that's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, how do you retain your spirituality in that? How do you retain the fact that you know that even though you've been given it, it's maspia l'chol chayratzon, and rifua is like that? Hazan etakol? Yes, we make the bracha. We thank God for giving us this ability to, to create vaccines. And at the same time, holding on to the idea that it's still coming from God and still having that spiritual sensitivity to rely on God too, and not to only be relying on medical science. That's what Chizkiyahu was doing. He was ganazeta sefer. He didn't destroy the sefer. He 
put it aside so that people would find the right balance. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to have this balance of looking at medical science for its, for its wonderful gifts, and at the same time, not losing our emuna and realizing that ultimately it's low hanachash. It's not the medical staff that is really healing. It's the fact that God has given the medical staff that uh, staff tarte mashma, the ability to heal, that is what heals. Lo, the lo hanachash, uh, but it is ultimately avinu um, shebashamai. Okay. Thank you, and a wonderful Shabbat. I will now try to post the Makorot um, and uh, the um, uh, and Shabbat Shalom. Two questions.